Despite the fact that there are no periodic orbits in one-dimensional continuous time systems, well, there is a way to get it to work out. But this requires something of a circular detour. Let's take some time and talk about circles. We are going to define the circle. What do you mean, define the circle? How do you do that? It's just a circle. Oh, no. There is a mathematical definition for S1. The circle, S1, is a topological space that can be equivalently defined in a number of different ways. So, for starters, we could work in the plane. We could look at the planar unit circle given by the solutions to the equation x squared plus y squared equals 1. Great, that works fine. But what if we switched to the complex plane and we said we looked at all the complex numbers that have modulus 1? That gives a shape that looks exactly the same. It's a planar unit circle. But if we're working in the complex plane, I remember Euler's formula, which parametrizes that circle by looking at e to the i theta. Do you remember Euler's formula? e to the i theta is cosine theta plus i sine theta. So for real values of theta, that's going to give you that same circle. But there's something funny that happens in that that angle really only needs to be defined up to multiples of 2 pi. So what if we just restricted that parameter to the interval from 0 to 2 pi so that we're only going around that circle once? And that's great, except for the fact that we have to glue together. We have to identify 2 pi with zero. This leads to something called an identification space, where I take the interval from zero to two pi, and I glue the two endpoints together to get a circle. And if you really want to get fancy, then the way to do this is to express this as something called a quotient space, where with a little bit of reparameterization, we could say that the circle is really the reals modulo the integers. We say that two real numbers are equivalent or the same if they differ by an integer. And that quotient space also gives you the circle. Now, some of these look different than others, but they're really all the same. Well, I have to be a little more precise here. These are not all the same objects, but they are all homeomorphic topological spaces. Wow, those are three big words there. It's going to take a little bit of effort to unpack them. In fact, it's going to take a side quest on topology and homeomorphism. So let's ascend to a different world and take some time and talk about the definition of a topological space. We're going to have to define a topology on a set. A topology on a set X is a collection, capital T, of subsets of X that satisfy the following properties. This collection is closed under arbitrary unions, it's closed under finite intersections, and it contains both the full set X and the empty set. These sets, these special sets, these elements of the topology are called the open sets of your space X. And any open set containing a point P is said to be a neighborhood of that point P. That's it. That's what a topology is. It seems kind of weird, kind of complicated, but it's not so bad. If you look at the reals, then the standard topology is just generated by little open intervals. Take arbitrary unions of those, and yes, those are the open sets. If instead of the real number line, you're in Rn, then the standard topology is, again, it's just generated by open balls. So a neighborhood of a point is just a, a little open ball or anything that you can obtain as unions of open balls. Now, this doesn't immediately reveal itself to be the deep definition that it is, but oh, it's so important. Because by looking at these neighborhoods of points, it allows you to get a notion of proximity without having to say what the exact distance between two points is. By taking a system of neighborhoods, by partially ordering them under inclusion, you could talk about things like limits and all the kinds of things that you remember from calculus class using epsilons and deltas. It can all be done with topology. And in particular, 
we can define a homeomorphism between topological spaces. A homeomorphism between two spaces, x and y, is a function f such that it is bijective. It pairs up points between these two spaces. That means it's one-to-one -one and onto. And in addition, this homeomorphism has to be continuous with a continuous inverse, which means that it is a bijection on neighborhoods as well. So it not only matches up all the points between the spaces, it matches up all the neighborhoods, it matches up the topology, it gives you equivalent topologies on these two spaces. So we say that homeomorphic spaces have the same topological properties, they're topologically equivalent. But oh, I'm so tired from those definitions. Let's get back to the show. Let's get back to the circle. And what we're claiming is that these different representations of S1 are really all homeomorphic. Now, it would take a little bit of work to write out explicit homeomorphisms between these, to go from the unit circle in the plane to the set of points of modulus 1 in the complex field to the parametrized circle via Euler's formula to taking the interval and closing up the endpoints to looking at reals modulo integers. But all of these representations can be connected up by homeomorphisms, by things that take neighborhoods to neighborhoods. Now, that's kind of a long story and we haven't even done any dynamics yet, so this is clearly something that is to be continued. A circle, the circle, is a topological space, and although it is really an abstraction, it's not that weird. You use it all the time when you're doing mathematics, when you're doing trig, when you're doing pre-calculus. We are going to find it useful when we're doing dynamical systems.